Would you also steal drugs from these drug dealers, Mr. Down? Yes. Would the other officers steal drugs from the drug dealers as well? Yes. I don't know what they did with it, all of them, but, you know, some of them, some of them even gave it to us. Some people have said that this kind of corruption is a matter of opportunity, but what you seem to be saying is that this was premeditated and planned. Is that your experience? It was a daily basis. I, I, it was something that happened daily. It was planned. I don't know if you had to plan that. It was just regular, everyday patrol. You said you set goals in the amount of money that you wanted to make, correct? Correct that you would pick out certain locations to hit, correct? Yes. That you would go to a clandestine location known as the pool to yes. plan this. So what you're talking about here is a number of officers planning how to use the narcotics trade to steal from the narcotics trade for their own personal gain. If, yeah, that's planning. As your time in the 75th Precinct continued, did you find other opportunities as well besides shaking down drug dealers for making money off the job? I found a lot of ways to make money. What about with regard to what you called radio runs, call for service? Were they opportunities for corruption for you? <coughs> uh, yes. There was plenty of opportunities. The radio runs were the ones that would give me the tips on where to go and where not to go. Well, how, what, how do you mean that, sir? Well, by uh, <clears throat> the best way to do, uh, I guess I'm going to teach everybody how to make money here. The best Let's way to not, make. Mr. Huh? Let's hope not. Let's just get. Well, to that's, the truth. I, I don't. I, I'm embarrassed by saying a lot of these things. It's not that simple, you know. The best way I would uh, pick a radio run is by the infrequency of the, or the, the least probability of it being called. Um, maybe you'll get a call ten times a day, you'll get the same location or the same address. And you know it's really not a good call to go on to make money. Not only has it been hit three times already that day, but also it's just, it's played out and it's a good chance you're going to get set up. Okay, let me stop you there for a moment, Mr. Dow. So what you're saying is, as your experience as a police officer uh, grew, you would also get a better sense or a better smell for corruption opportunities? Certainly. Okay. Why don't you give us an example of how now, as you've become an experienced corrupt cop, um, you knew what opportunities on radio runs might be lucrative? I'll give you a, a case scenario, if that's sufficient. Please. Uh, I have an incident where uh, we'll get a call for shots fired at a certain, des a certain address, Pine Street, say, off the corner of Linden Boulevard. It's a very quiet area. Nothing goes on down there. Uh, you don't often get a, even a fake call down there, never mind a, a call for, say, someone shot. So you, you know, your experience tells you that this is probably a good call. Uh, the sad thing is that someone's probably shot and someone's probably dead. But the other thing in the back of your mind, which was my mind at the time, was that there's probably a reason this person was shot, and it's probably over money and drugs. And so, it just so happened that uh, when you get, you, when your experience tells you these things, and you know. So when you get a location that is a rare location over the radio, what do you do, even if it's not your sector? Do you go there? Well, if I wanted money that day, yes. Okay, so what would happen? Do you have an example? Did that ever occur in your yes, experience? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'll give you the example on uh, Pine Street. There was a man shot through the peephole of his, uh, his door. Obviously, he was shot by a friend because the door was unlocked. And uh, we arrived at the location. Mind you, if I describe these things, it's not so easy. They're, they're hectic. People are running around. I'm walking into this building with 
Guy dead on the floor here, gunfire going off upstairs, doors and drawers and cabinets and everything opening and closing. And in my warped mind, I'm saying they're hiding the drugs. You know, I'm, not, I'm not worried so much about the guns and I'm worried about, oh shit, uh, they're hiding the drugs or the, uh, the money. In other words, you're, you're concerned that you might not find drugs and money there. I knew they were hiding it. I was getting a little concerned, but I, I, that there was, uh, I knew there was big weapons in the house, so I had to step back a little. Uh, that's just the way it was. So what happened in that incident? Well, a after I convinced the people upstairs that I was the police and I wasn't going to hurt them, they came to the stairwell. I, I, you got a picture. It's a long climbing stairs, and they're upstairs, and I don't know what's up there, and uh, you're scared. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking about the drugs and the money. Uh, I had to get up there. Sure enough, I got up there, and I found it. I found uh, another table, almost like these things. These tables are perfect for them. Another table like this with uh, drugs on it and empty crack vials, thousands and thousands of empty crack vials. So I knew I was on a spot. So what I did was I, I had my partner watch the door, because now you got to realize it's a hectic scene. There's people dead. There's, uh, there's, there's a lot of cops coming and going. So I had my partner watch the door while I searched this room. Well, he got a little excited. He came in the room with me, and we had another cop outside watching the door. And meanwhile, there's 15 cops in and out of the place. My partner found a gun, and he's a gun buff, so he wanted to take the gun. I told him, put the gun down. We got drugs over here, and uh, drugs is, you can buy 10 times the guns than you can with the drug money. So we took a bag of drugs out of the house. And did you manage to resell that? Yeah. How much, what was your score on that particular incident, Mr. Dowd? Uh, I can't be accurate with that. I'd say $1,200, I don't know. Sorry? Maybe $1,200. Did there come a time, Mr. Dowd, where you made even bigger scores than that? Did your ambitions increase? Yes. Could you tell us about that, how that developed? Well, I had another job where I came across uh, a, a half a kilo of cocaine. Now, how did you come across that? Was that a radio run? No, that was a pickup. It was a, it was a robbery in the street. I picked up the job. Uh, I went to a house. I followed the kid in. They no I knocked on the door. The young kid let me in and my partner. And we went through the house and we were able to determine it was a drug house. How did you determine it was a drug house? The looks. The house was too well uh, furnished. Too much money was spent inside the house. And that sort of uh, set off your instincts? Immediately. So what did you do? Well, again, a lot of cops show up because it was a pickup of a robbery. Guns were involved. You know, cops are trying to help each other out. And they come, they show up. And I pushed the collar off on some young cops, and I continued to search the house. And when you say you pushed the collar off on some young cops, can you explain what you mean by that phrase? Well, push the collar. I, young guys showed up. It's a gun collar. They're excited. You want a gun collar, kid? Yes. So they're happy to get. They're the happy arrest. to take it. I'm happy to get rid of it because I don't want to go through central booking and go through all the paperwork. And I know there's something else going on here, so I'm more interested in that. So they take the arrest and leave, and then you and your partner do what? Search the house. What do you eventually find? We found a locked suitcase. Uh, I'll tell you how it happened. I find a locked suitcase downstairs in the basement behind something like this, drapes. So I take the suitcase out from behind, and my, I shake it, and I, uh, actually I'm praying it's money because it's heavy, but it turns out we couldn't open the briefcase. So my partner ran to the back and got a hacksaw in the guy's workroom, and I hacksawed the uh, box open, uh, the briefcase open, and I pulled out a half a kilo of cocaine. What'd you do with the cocaine? Well, I slipped it under my jacket, and I walked out of the house, only to be confronted by the owner, who got me nervous. I felt like I was stealing his drugs. I might get in trouble. I don't know. Did you, was there ever a complaint made about that, Mr. Dowd? Any complaint at all in that, that incident? No. Were you able to sell the cocaine? Yes. Was that through yourself, your own efforts, or your partner's efforts? My partner took it. 
What was the score, so to speak, on that sale of drugs? $14,000. Mr. Dowd, how much money would you estimate in your first two or three years in the 75th Precinct you were making um, from your illicit activities, from scores, shaking down drug dealers and the rest? In the early years? Yes, sir. Before 1986. I don't know, 500 to 1,000 a week on the average. Mr. Dow, a few minutes ago, you said there are other ways to make money in addition to uh, money off drug dealers. Do you care to tell us some of the other ways that we're able to make money on the job? Well, I had said that we making money on the job means often not spending money. I know you said that some time ago, but a few minutes ago, when you were saying how you were making money of drug dealers, you also said there were other ways to make money. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, no. there are other ways, like uh, burglaries. Uh, are... well, did you actually engage in burglaries? Yes. Will you tell us some of the circumstances, please? Um, well, there'd be a burglary. Uh, actually, I would get called to a burglarized house. And uh, if you want me to give you an instance, I'll give you an instance on how and how it happened. Um, this is probably the most embarrassing thing I ever did as a police officer. I was called to a burglary in progress. The woman that was at the home was a young lady in her early 20s. She is nervous to go in her home, so we accompanied her into, into the home and we checked the place out. And there's a lot more to it before I just say this. Um, I had gotten a new partner at the time, and, and there, uh, he, I had to prove to him that I was good. So in order to prove to him that I was good, I had to, I had to give him some reason to think that I was, to know that I was good. So what I had done was I told the woman, I said, listen, uh, we don't know if they, they took anything from your house or not, because you're, you're, where's your mother? She's, she's at work. So the mother, I told her, why don't you call your mother at work and tell her uh, and ask her if she has anything hidden in the house that might be missing. So she called her mother, and her mother told her where the money was hidden, and I found it for her. But she never got it. You found it and you took it? Yeah. What sum of money was that, approximately? I'm sorry? What amount of money was that? That was a small amount at the time. It was like $600, $800. Mr. Dowd, I'd, I'd like to just go back for a moment um, to the time in which um, you were engaging, as you said before, in making scores at radio runs and shaking down drug dealers in your first years at the precinct, because I understand that that incident happened a little bit later right. on, as you explained to the chairman. Right. However, the chairman makes a good point. Besides the drug trade in your first years in the uh, 75th precinct, were there other ways that you would make money off the job with regard to, let's say, business owners? Well, I, I personally didn't get paid from any business owners. What about getting gifts? Yes. How would that happen, Mr. Dowd? How would you become involved with the um, business owners, people in the community, in order to engage in that kind of corruption? Well, you go, well, it's, everybody likes to have a, a police officer in his store, in and out of his store during the course of a day. They feel safe, and uh, the, the, the neighborhood people see cops in and out of there, so they're less likely to stick them up or bother them or rob them when they leave. And so what happens? So they entice you by, by, by making a nice office to you, whatever it might be. If it's a clothing factory, they offer you clothes. If it's a food place, they give you free food. Uh, so and you would take the clothing and the food as from the business owners? Yes. Mr. Dowd, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was the commission has heard evidence before your appearance here that police officers on occasion used informants um, in order to assist them in identifying locations that they might hit. 
Was that true in your experience as well? Yes. How would that take place in your experience, Mr. Dowd? How would that take place? Yes. Well, you speak to a local drug dealer or a, or a drug user, or somebody who uh, maybe they're tired of being shaken down and they want you to leave them alone, so they give you other information. Or um, you happen to catch them with a couple of pieces of uh, narcotics on them, and it's not worth the arrest and it's not worth taking, usually you let them go. Did, has that happened to you? In your, did you use informants to hit drug spots? Yes. Do you recall any particular example? I'm thinking of a uh, bodega on the corner of Shepherd Avenue. Yes. How did that take place? How did you use the informant to identify a location for corruption? Well, that was back in 1985 now. Again, I've, I've as lost I, a little... As I said, I wanted to go back to that, uh, to that time period. In uh, not, yeah, well, what happened then was uh, my partner, who was really... He, he, was, he was into coke a lot at the time, and maybe I didn't know it. And uh, we found this guy who had actually come out of the spot, which was a, was a bodega, and um, he had drugs on him, and uh, he told us where he got it and how he got it. So we planned uh, for the following day to go back there and hit the spot with him. What we had was we, we told him to go in, buy his piece, and then come out, and if he has, if, he, if they had, we would go in and hit the store ourselves in uniform. And did you do that? Yes. Did the people in that store make a complaint against you and your partner? I believe someone tried to. You say tried to. What happened, based on your knowledge? Well, we took a gun and some drugs, and, and uh, one of the women, there was a woman uh, who, uh, she was crazy. She went to the precinct to tell the police that I took her gun. <laughs> what happened when she got to the... Uh... The station. I don't know that she ever made it to the desk. I don't know. I don't even know. Oh, maybe they thought she was crazy. Was it your attitude that your supervisors would protect you with regard to allegations of corruption that came in about you in these early years? Yes. Would they, they, they deflected a lot of it. Would they tell you about that? Well, there were instances where they let us let it be known. Let it be known that what? that we were uh, getting some complaints or that we may be being watched. And would that assist you in uh, covering up or concealing well, it, your corruption? It would help us either change our patterns or stop. Did anyone ever tell me to stop? No. Mr. Dowd, did there come a time in 1986 that you were transferred out of the 75th precinct? Yes. Based on your conversations with police officers in that precinct and with supervisors, how many police officers would you say knew about the corruption that you and your crew were engaging in at the time? The whole precinct. Were your supervisors, like the integrity control officer and the commanding officer, aware of this? Yes. How do you know that? <clears throat> Well, my uh, partner happened to be friendly with the ICO and uh, the integrity control officer, and uh, he had made mention that uh, there was a, uh, someone made a, a complaint and just watch yourselves. And then uh, shortly thereafter, um, I was called in by the inspector to drive him to a borough meeting. And I drove, my partner and I drove him down to the meeting, and it just seemed very odd. Uh, you know, cops have a sixth sense of, about things. They knew, they know when something's up. And I knew something was up, so did my partner. We dropped the uh, inspector off at the uh, borough meeting. He said it was an emergency borough meeting, and these things don't happen. The inspector being the commanding officer of the 75th precinct? Yes. So after we dropped him off, um, he, we went back and he called for us to come back and pick him up about two hours later. Well, when we picked him up, we got him in the car. And my driving scared the heck out of him, but other than that, he had the chance to say to me uh, and my partner, why don't you just, uh, put a 57 in? Uh, 57, now, a 57 is a, a transfer form from one precinct to another. So 
he, he didn't let us say a word. He just said, I think you two guys are burnt out and uh, the ghetto's got the best of you. It's time to move on. So uh, that was pretty subtle. That was a pretty subtle hint right there. So in, he asked you to uh, get yourself transferred out of his command. Yes. And you were pretty much, based on your knowledge, known to be a pretty serious discipline problem at that time? I, I, I don't think that's, that would be a total, totally accurate, but it would, I, I was a problem, yeah. I, I guess I can't cover that any longer. I was a problem. Did you um, eventually get transferred out of the 75th Precinct in 1986? Yes. Mr. Dowd, I'd like to stop you there a moment. During this time, were there rumors circulating your, around your command about a major investigation into police corruption? Yes. And that eventually, um, the it result... The, it was about the 77th Precinct. It was about the 77th Precinct? Yes. Did you follow the results of the 77th Precinct case, you and your fellow officers? Yes. Were you very interested in what was going on there? Well, I was happy it wasn't us. Do you know that 13 police officers were arrested and indicted as a result of that investigation? Yes. Would you say, based on your first-hand knowledge, that the 75th Precinct was as infested with corruption among cops as the 77th Precinct was at that time? Without a doubt. Mr. Dowd, for all of the time that you were in the 75th Precinct up until 1986 before your transfer, and all the acts of corruption which you've described for us in crimes, did you ever once receive any discipline whatsoever before to 1986? I don't think so. While you were there, Mr. Dowd, at uh, the 75th Precinct, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the motivation for uh, what you were doing? Um, in other words, was it because you needed the money? Uh, was it because it was a thrill for you and your partner to do this? What were you thinking? Well, there was a com it's a combination of basically what you said. It was, it was a thrill. It, it, let me back up for one second. The original reasons a lot of these things are done is not to be so, so corrupt. In the beginning, you start out saying, um, you know, you're angry that the drug dealers basically run the street. And you're angry that you have no dent into what they're doing. So in the beginning, you start, well, what the heck? If we arrest them, we get a complaint by our CO or our, or our sergeant that, what'd you do? You took two crack vials off the street. You cost the city 16 hours overtime. What's going on here? So, you know, it's that attitude. And then next day, you won't get the same assignment. You'll be on a foot post in the weeds by, uh, by the Bell Parkway. So this is how it begins. And this is how it began with us. And then the negative reinforcement constantly, you know, you said, well, what the heck? Make them pay a tax. Make the drug dealers pay a tax. I mean, don't get me wrong. I didn't go to intend to rob drug dealers. I, I made drug arrests when I first got there. But very, very quickly, you turned off to this by the department itself. And if anybody tells you any different, they're lying. Thanks. <clears throat> Mr. Dowd, when you... Uh were transferred uh, out of the 75th Precinct. What detail were you put in then in uh, May of 1986? I was put in the Coney Island detail. What is the Coney Island detail? The Coney Island detail is basically uh, you walk along the boardwalk for the summer. Is it a place where police officers who are known as discipline problems we go to? We call it the dumping. We, we get dumped there from the precinct. It's, it's not a favorable assignment for cops in Brooklyn because they got to travel to the end of Brooklyn and it adds that much more travel time to their assignment, to their day. After your conversation with the inspector, the commanding officer of the 75th Precinct, were you thereafter assigned with your partner to the Coney Island detail? Yes, and a few of us, a few others. And a few others from the 75th Precinct? Yes. What was your experience there, sir? It was a lot of fun. Well, can you tell us what you mean by fun? Oh, it was fun. It was uh, 
one drunk day after another. Did you do any police work whatsoever while you were there? I don't think, I don't, you know, what's police work? Police work standing out and making sure you're seen visibly. And you were there day after day in uniform, drunk. Most of the time. Did you have supervisors in the Coney Island detail? Sergeants and lieutenants? Yes. Were you observed by them in that kind of condition? Yes. What was the reaction or the consequences of that? Well, there was no consequences. Uh, I mean, one time we were tipped off uh, that we were getting caught in a... Uh, someone made a complaint that the cops were hanging out in a bar. So the lieutenant told us at roll call one day, I know it's none of you guys, but someone made a complaint that the cops are hanging out in a bar in uniform. So after the beads of sweat went away on my brow, I didn't go back there. What happened to your partner um, during the Coney Island detail? He quit. He resigned? Yeah, he resigned. Why did he resign? Because of uh, the noise coming out from the 7-7 investigation and because he had a feeling that one day he might get arrested. Did you have any dangerous experiences while you were out in Coney Island, while you were intoxicated, as you described? Yes. Tell the commissioners what that was. I, uh, well, I was very, very, very drunk, so even that's a little cloudy, the memory of it. All I remember was we were coming back to the precinct, and, uh, We were in a police blazer, and they had just stopped off and picked up some Dunkin' Donuts. Strange. And uh, I usually don't eat Dunkin' Donuts. And I ate it, and I threw up all over the inside the car because I was so drunk that they were trying to sober me up is what they were doing. <clears throat> when we got back in front of the precinct, uh, a crazed crazed guy came to the precinct with a toy gun in his hand and pointed it at about 40 cops. Miraculously, he didn't get shot. He threw the gun down and it broke in half. And I was so drunk, I was in the car and I was pointing the gun through the window of the Jeep. And ranting and raving in my drunk stupor. Uh, I ended up assisting and cuffing them. Don't have me ask me how I got there. I probably flew. And then I ended up uh, carrying him back into the precinct. Well, carrying, assisting him back into the precinct with the lieutenant in tow. With your... I didn't know the lieutenant was there. I couldn't see. Did you ever receive from that lieutenant any sort of discipline for being drunk and unholstering your firearm while you were in that condition? No. No. Mr. Dow, did you ever get any offer of treatment or help at that point in your career? No. Even though there were a lot of people, including officers who observe, uh, senior officers who observed your condition. Mr. Chairman, with the uh, commission's permission, we'd like to take a five-minute recess at this point. Sir, we'll recess for five minutes. We'll return at 11.05.
We Americans have an endless fascination with police stories. Just look at the popularity over the years of TV cop shows. Some true to life, others pure fiction. Well, there's a police story being told here in New York this week that is so shocking, you couldn't make it up. Richard Threlkeld has the story in tonight's Eye on America. What would you steal? Money and drugs and guns, whatever was there. Why were these beatings done? To show who was in charge. We were in charge, the police. I wasn't the first person to think of this. It was ongoing. Every day on the streets of New York, it's cops against criminals, good guys against the bad guys. But as police corruption hearings have revealed this week, some of New York's policemen are the bad guys. I remember reaching into a, a box full of uh, cocaine and taking out two big handfuls and putting them in my pocket and walking out. The star witness, Michael Dowd, a police officer for 10 years before he was convicted on drug and racketeering charges. He and a handful of fellow officers turned into common criminals, he said, while his superiors looked the other way. There was times when I was shocked that I got away with so many of these things. What did he get away with? Burglary, for one thing. This is probably my most embarrassing thing I ever did as a police officer. While investigating a burglary, he had the victim's daughter call her mother to ask if she had any valuables hidden in the house. So she called her mother, and her mother told her where the money was hidden, and I found it for her. But she never got it. Eventually, Michael Dowd got rich, a fancy sports car, fancy clothes, four homes. How much money were you making a week for your narcotics activities? Anywhere between four and five thousand dollars. How much money were you making a week from your New York, New York City paycheck? About four hundred. What protected him, Dowd said, was the so-called blue wall of silence. Cops don't snitch on other cops, even if they're bad cops. He learned that, he said, as a recruit at the police academy. Us against them. When you say us against them, who is the us, Mr. Dowd? Us is the police officers and them is the public. Dowd wasn't the only witness. Bernard Cawley's a former cop now in prison on drug charges. They called him the mechanic because he beat people up, innocent people too. How many individuals do you think you administered beatings to in the 46th precinct? Approximately three to four hundred people. Mr. Coley, weren't you ever afraid of getting caught at doing this? No. Who's going to catch us? We're the police. Why was all this allowed to happen? Sergeant Joseph Primboli, a police investigator who for years tried unsuccessfully to bring some of the bad cops to justice, says that police brass looked the other way. There was a lack of resolve to go after these individuals and that it would be a tremendous embarrassment to the New York City Police Department. Former officer Cawley put it more simply. Were you ever afraid that one of your fellow officers might turn you in? Never. Why not? Because it was the blue wall of silence. Cops don't tell on cops. Police officials insist that the troubles this time are not nearly so serious nor pervasive as corruption scandals in the past, that Dowd and the others are just exceptions to the rule. Perhaps, but after a week of these hearings, New Yorkers are wondering just how exceptional those bad cops really are. In New York, I'm Richard Threlkeld for Eye on America. And that's our news. Coming up tomorrow on CBS This Morning, live coverage of the raging wildfires in California.